I'd like to welcome Jan de Koning from Rubico in the Netherlands. As a senior portfolio manager in the core quants team, he will explain how they integrate environmental, social and governance aspects in their factor investing approach. Ray, thanks for that very nice introduction. I'd rather be in London, to be honest, but uh, maybe next year we can uh, be seeing each other live on the uh, stage again. And for in the meantime, I think this is a great way to talk to you in the next half an hour about integrating sustainability in portfolios, equity portfolios, and in particular, factor-based portfolios. So uh, I'm more than happy to share our experiences into this field and talk to you about all the challenges of factor investing and sustainability investing, and more importantly, how you can overcome them by creating one integrated approach. So let's get started. And let's get started by going back some 10 years in time, because we've seen a very strong trend towards sustainability investing that started over, I would say, 20, 30 years ago, but especially over the last few years, things really have gained some momentum. So for example, if we start in the year 2010, um, you can see clearly that back in the day, so 10 years ago, there were only some 500 equity funds available to the sustainable investor. Uh, and some 53% of the top 100 corporates were really issuing sustainability reports. And the amount of money invested in sustainability, yeah, it was large if you look at the number, it was over 100 billion US dollars, but still, if you look to the total assets and the management of global investors, it was really still only a small piece of the pie that was really following sustainability guided principles in their portfolios. Hey, but fast forward to uh, 2020, and what do we've got now? Well, it's really what you can see here over here. Over 75% of the top 100 corporations are really reporting on sustainability. There are over 3,000 report uh, funds available to investors, and the amount of money invested in sustainability funds has really reached the 1 trillion mark as well. So sustainability investing is really gaining momentum and it's here to stay. And there are basically three drivers for this trend towards sustainability investing. So first of all, there are the clients, of course. There are the regulators and the asset managers. And let me explain uh, all of these three driving forces to you. So first of all, let's start with the clients. And there's a very interesting thing going on if you look to the background of a lot of clients and their needs for sustainability investing. Because if you were to ask them the question, how important is sustainability uh, investing for your decision making in your portfolios? Well, if you would ask that question to investors born before 1940, then so close to 40% of those investors are saying, yes, it is very important to integrate sustainability in your investment decision-making. However, if you were to ask this question to millennials, you get a different answer. Because if you can see over here, investors born after 1980, so really the millennials, close to 90% really requests or even requires sustainability to be at the core of the investment themes. So sustainability is extremely important to the younger generation, the generation which is growing up and is also really managing money. Next, the regulators. So institutional investors are increasingly more required to report on ESG. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward because if you see the amount of policy interventions that took place over the last 50 years, you can clearly see that there's more and more policy interventions on sustainability matters over the last couple of years. So also regulators are really focusing on whether companies are integrating sustainability into their business models as well. And also a lot of legislation has come up. So for example, if you look at this overview, you see many flags and all these flags just represents country or countries or like the European Union on uh, the bottom right of this overview, which came up with a lot of sustainability related laws and law enforcement that's taking place around the theme of sustainability investing. 
take for example South Africa where every listed company needs to file an integrated report or in the European Union where basically the European Union is pushing a lot of firms and especially the fiduciary managers to integrate sustainability in their decision making and also in the UK and in France you see basically similar type of developments coming up. Also the institutional investors have to be aware of what the regulators are uh, aiming to achieve. So this ongoing push towards sustainability regulation is really a force for good. And we as investors need to be aware of that. But there are also asset managers that really want to in integrate more sustainability into their portfolios of their clients. And a very good yardstick for that is in fact the UNPRI. So a lot of asset managers have signed the UNPRI as a statement that they really want to integrate more and more sustainability into their investment strategies that they offer to their clients. Well, 10 years ago, only over 700 asset managers have signed the UNPRI. However, fast forward 10 years, at the year 2020, you see over two and a half thousand signatories among asset managers. So also the asset manager is really aware the sustainability is here to stay and is probably the only way forward for the next couple of years. And of course, yeah, I wouldn't be here presenting behind my laptop if it wasn't due to the fact that we had this uh, global pandemic, the COVID-19 uh, crisis, which is uh, currently uh, going on in the world. So this driver for growth has been basically accelerated, we believe, by this uh, COVID-19 uh, disease which is uh, going all over the world now and as you have seen for example in March but also the subsequent uh, months that followed you saw that the oil prices were dropping sustainability funds were outperforming we also were a lot of reports in the news that the amount of pollution in the air not only in China but all the other parts of the world was really coming down and also what we now are observing that a lot of fiscal stimuli that governments are doing, are pushing towards uh, their uh, markets and to their countries, they basically include special chapters on sustainability. So in other words, they really require that the fiscal stimuli are also targeted on integrating more sustainability policies as well. Second of all, we see that consumers are shifting to cleaner transport, uh, production is more reshoring, so not so much only uh, uh, putting your globalization very far away, getting your product from the other side of the planet, no near shoring, production very close to the consumer is really taking off. And look at us nowadays, there's a lot of de decentralized work, we commute less. So this awareness that we can change our lives for something better, where we really focus on sustainability, that's a force for good. And we expect that to just accelerate as well. But if I talk about sustainability, how important is that really then that we're focusing on integrating this in our portfolios? Well, to just give you a very brief uh, uh, summary why it is very important, let's assume you shower every morning 12 minutes and you decide to shower five minutes less, then you save only a little bit of carbon each year. However, if your daily commute is 50 kilometers uh, to go to your work and one day per week, you would work from home and you would go or you would just go by train. Then you can basically see that the amount of carbon uh, reduction is way higher. It's nine times higher than just showering five minutes less. And more importantly, what if you have a big investment portfolio of some 300,000 euros and you would fully shift this towards sustainability? Well, then the impact is huge as you can see here, because then you really can mitigate a lot of sustainability risks also in portfolios. So investing for sustainability is a force for good and you can really make a very big impact into, uh, uh, I would say, our lives as well, but just changing your portfolio. But if you talk about sustainability, there are a lot of questions that pop up. Do you need to focus on exclusions, best in class, engagement, and so on? There are various different objectives. And also a question that I get a lot is that people ask me, Jan, what's now really the best approach? Is it focusing on excluding tobacco? Do I have to focus on voting? Do I have to focus on water footprint? And as you can see while the screen fills up, there are many different ways of integrating sustainability in portfolios. And the number one question, of course, that I get most of the times, 
if you talk about sustainability and investing, what about the performance? Is it hurting my performance? Is it improving my performance? Well, in the next remainder of this uh, presentation of mine, I really want to focus on the challenges of integrating sustainability in portfolios and how uh, with a factor-based approach, you can really integrate sustainability in the best possible way while still capturing alpha opportunities. So let's get started with the real, I would say, uh, heavy lifting of sustainability integrating in equity portfolios. Let's first start with exclusions. As you can see, there are many types of exclusions. You can exclude firearm producers, which can also do tobacco, nuclear power, and so on. And you can see that various different themes do apply and there are various ways or categories that you can exclude out of portfolios. For example, if you look to a pension plan of a big town in Switzerland, they just exclude two different sectors, controversial weapons and global compacts of United Nations. But there are also investors that go a step further. The largest investor in the world, the Norges Oil Fund, they exclude some more sectors. And especially some uh, investors with a more religious background, yeah, they do exclude way more categories. And I think this really applies to a lot of investors that excluding certain categories is very personal. And it also gives a very big challenge, as I will discuss later on. Um, exclusion, that's okay, it's values-based. Some industries or some sectors we just don't want to invest in. But as an investor, yeah, you cannot just exclude all the sectors that you want to exclude because you also have to manage your portfolio that needs to deliver a return or manage some risk levels. And to explain you to this in a little bit more detail, I want to show you this overview. So here you basically see that if you exclude a few sectors like firearms, nuclear, gambling, or embryonic cloning, then your portfolio return will closely mimic probably the return of a global equity portfolio. And why is that the case? Well, very simply, the amount of stocks that you're excluding is limited. It's only a few percentage points of companies that are classifying as nuclear power producers, gambling companies, or firearms producers. So your deviation with the global market portfolio, that blue line that you see there, that's not much. So in other words, if you just want to exclude a few sectors or industries, that's okay. You don't have to worry about the impact on your portfolio. However, the moment that you're going to exclude more companies, things start to change. Let me explain that. Here you see that the moment you exclude more companies or sectors with a bigger weight in big indices, you can see that your portfolio starts to deviate from the market portfolio. The tracking error or the active risk is really going up. Your portfolio may outperform, but it may also underperform. One thing is for sure, you will see some more volatility compared to the return of that market portfolio. And if you were to exclude even more, yeah, then that tracking error is just going more up and up. Well, that's one issue with exclusions. Well, then we also have best-in-class investing. Best-in-class investing is quite popular, and best-in-class investing basically means that you focus on selecting the best companies from every sector. Um, but yeah, big question, where to draw that line? Do you need to focus on the top 50% companies? Or, like for example, the FTSE for good indices are doing, or should you just as an investor say, hey, I'm going to focus only on the top 25% best companies? So for example, what the MSCI SRI indices are doing. Or you can be even more outspoken. What if you were only focusing on the top 10%? So the best 10% companies ranked on sustainability scores. There are indices out there which are giving investors exposure to these kind of companies. And that sounds very great because it means you can have access to a portfolio of stocks with a very good sustainability profile, but there are also some consequences, some challenges that you need to overcome. Because again, if you look to um, best-in-class investing and you focus on the top 50% stocks in the universe, so the companies with the 50% best scores, you will get a portfolio that will deviate with regards to returns a little bit compared to the returns of the market portfolio. So in other words, if you focus on the top 50% companies, the best scoring ones, yeah, your return of your portfolio will deviate a bit. Not that much, but it will deviate. You can also focus on the top 10%. So that means you're really gonna ignore the 90% worst companies 
in the world when it comes to their sustainability scores. And you really focus on those companies that are really belonging to the top 10%. So the best sustainability portfolios. You can see then that your deviation of the return of your portfolio is really going up. You really see that that line, that green line is moving upwards, but also sometimes downward. So it's more volatile. Your tracking error is higher. And even more, and a lot of investors need to be aware of this big challenge, the moment you're going to focus on the top 10% stocks in the universe, it also means that your portfolio gets a maybe a little bit different composition. And what do I mean with that? Well, just take a look at this overview. One step back, if you would focus on the top 50% best companies in the world, so really the 50% best ones with the highest sustainability scores, you probably get a very well diversified portfolio. So you probably get a core portfolio a more large cap oriented portfolio, like what you can see in that graph on the right hand side. However, the moment that you're going to focus on the top 10%, yeah, then you're really gonna get most of the times a more large cap portfolio. And yeah, that large cap portfolio might be very much core, but it can also become a value or growth portfolio. Because if you have a portfolio, which is focusing on the top 10%, sustainability stocks in the universe and these top sustainability stocks are also very growth like yeah you get a growth portfolio but it can also become value like so in other words your i would say factor or style bias of your portfolio yeah that's basically a big question mark you don't know what you're going to get it's a big challenge for investors but we can overcome that i like i can point that out later to you so that's about best in class investing. There's also a third way of investing when it comes to sustainability integration. And that is reducing your carbon footprint. Well, this is one of the most popular ways of integrating sustainability in portfolios. And as you can see by the examples that I'm going to show you, there are many different carbon reductions that a lot of institutional investors uh, are pushing for. So for example, you have some French investors that want to have a 10% lower carbon footprint, some Dutch investors going for a 25% lower carbon footprint, or the Australians, the Australian ethical fund, they don't even want to have any carbon footprint exposure. They go for a 100% reduction. Uh, so pretty big objectives there. And they also change through time and by type of investor. But what's the impact of lowering your carbon footprint? Well. Let's start with a lowering of your carbon footprint by some 20%. Normally, how investors do this is by just saying, well, I'm going to look at those companies in, for example, a big diversified portfolio that are really polluting a lot, that have a very high carbon footprint. And these companies, I'm just going to exclude them. And most of the time you find them in the energy, the materials or the utility sector. And by just excluding them, yeah, you can lower your carbon footprint by 20%. And that's good because your tracking error, your deviation from the market return portfolio is not that very big. But the moment you're going to exclude more or you want to lower your carbon footprint even more, yeah, that also means you need to exclude more companies. So if you want to have 30% reduction of your carbon footprint, you need to exclude more energy and utility stocks probably. And if you want to go even one step further and you say you want to reduce it by 40%, and you need to exclude even more companies. And then, yeah, your tracking error also goes up because, yeah, you're ignoring a big part of the equity universe. So a challenge for those investors that really want to have a lower carbon footprint in their portfolio. And with 50% reduction, you can imagine it's even a bigger challenge as, uh, for those type of investors wishing to accomplish that. So I talked about carbon footprint reduction, but that's only one part of the puzzle because you also have investors focusing on waste generation that needs to be lower than the waste generation of an index or they focus on water consumption reduction or energy generation reduction. And then the similar kind of uh, problems or challenges do apply as to the challenges that investors that like to lower their carbon footprint uh, face. You really have to exclude a lot of companies to bring down your carbon or your energy or your water or your waste generation footprint. So given this, how can we uh, solve this? 
Well, before I do that, I'd like to point out uh, one big challenge that most investors nowadays face with sustainability integration. They have so many different goals. For example, I show you here an investor that likes to exclude four categories, that likes to focus on the top 50% or the best 50% scoring companies of a universe, and also lowering the carbon, the waste, the water, and the energy footprint by 20%. So it's a very specific need of a certain investor. And a big problem that a lot of investors face is that it's sometimes difficult to find a fund or an investment solution that really ticks all their boxes. Because yeah, there are so many different sustainability needs and there are only so many funds available. And there's another challenge for investors. Because the moment that you're going to exclude a lot of companies, you do a lot of best-in-class investing, you lower your carbon footprint, well, it also has some consequences for your overall portfolio return. Because you can imagine that if you only exclude a few sectors, that it doesn't have a big impact on your alpha, while your sustainability is slowly improving. And if you were to integrate more sustainability into in your portfolio, yeah, then what you will see as an investor is that your universe starts to shrink. There are less companies you can choose from. So your ability to generate alpha is also slowly going down the moment you put more sustainability to work in your portfolio. So if you do exclude a lot of sectors, you have a very high best in class um, objective and also really want to go for very low um, carbon waste, water or energy footprint. Yeah, your, sub, your amount of companies you can choose from is really going down, so it will become more challenging to also create alpha out of such a portfolio. So the big question is, of course, how to solve this? Well, I can show you this by going to Las Vegas. And you might say, why Las Vegas? Well, I like to tell you this story about a very popular fund back in the days. It was a very popular fund some 10, 20 years ago, and it was called the Vice Fund. And the Vice Fund was basically investing in everything that was bad. So it invested in defense stocks, tobacco, alcohol, and gambling. And these stocks did outperform in the long run. So this fund did very well. And what's more, you even had academics, as you can see by Fabosi, Ma, and Olifant. They even published a study and they said, well, it's right that these companies that are more sinful, um, so alcohol, gambling, tobacco, these kind of companies. Yeah, they're very sinful, but they do have very strong returns. And the reason that they have very strong returns, that is probably to do with the fact that there's not a lot of competition in this field because not a lot of other investors are willing to enter that space due to very obvious reasons. So because of a lack of uh, competition, you got monopolistic pricing and these companies do very well on the stock market. Well, that was a very popular explanation and um, a lot of investors believe that story. And a few years ago, uh, one guy started to research into this and really started to question what, whether this was really true, whether this was right, that monopolistic pricing was the result that these sinful companies did so well. And this guy was David Blitz. He's a chief researcher at Robeco. Uh, with this piece of research, he really uh, also grabbed a lot of attention in the media. Because what David basically said, he said, well, yes, these companies do outperform in the long run, but it has nothing to do with the fact that they are sinful stocks because of their industries where they're active in. It has more to do with the fact that these companies have very good factor exposures. So they're very good quality, very good low risk scores, or very good momentum. So in other words, yeah, it's not so much their nature of the business, it's their factor exposure. And that idea of David, that insight, we can use that as quant investors to improve portfolios because it means that if you exclude a lot of companies or when you push your portfolio towards, I would say, very high best-in-class companies, you might need to exclude a lot of companies and it might lower the return of your portfolio. But if you were to replace those companies that are very sinful, that you want to exclude, by companies that are very sustainable, but with also very good factor profiles. So they have very good value exposure, very good quality exposure. Yeah, you can basically still get alpha out of such a portfolio. Well, let me explain this to you in a little bit more detail because it might sound a little bit academic and abstract. I'm aware of that. So 
let's start with this example. Instead of focusing on your top 50% companies with your best in class, what you can also do is just look at the entire overview of different sectors and rank all the companies on sustainability scores. So from very low to very high. So that means you're not just focusing on the top 50%. No, for every company in your portfolio, in your index, you're just assessing their sustainability scores. That's something that a lot of sustainability providers are doing. And it's also something that we at Robica are doing. We measure for every company, there's a sustainability score. And we can really indicate whether our company is scoring high or very low. After you have done that, we, you can do a second step as a quantitative investor. What you can do is that you can say, well, I'm not just going to look whether a company from a certain sector is very sustainable, whether it has a very good sustainability score. You can also simultaneously check whether these companies have very good factor scores. And it looks like this. So every company, yes, you can give that a score on its ESG characteristics, but you can also give it a score on its factor exposures. So does it have a lot of quality? Is it very value-like? Does it have a lot of momentum? These are all factor exposures. And ideally, as an investor that one that's targeting a portfolio that delivers alpha, but also is very sustainable, yeah, you focus, of course, on that segment of that matrix that is really um, yeah, known for the fact that these companies in that block have very high sustainability scores and also very high factor scores. You basically look for the best of both worlds when you compose a portfolio. And this relates to really the best in class scoring. You can do this and by focusing on these kind of ESG scores, but also their factor exposures, you can really target the best companies that you have there. And that's an approach that we've been doing for quite a few years because it helps to get alpha out of sustainability. And you can do this for best in class, but yeah, you can also do this for carbon, right? So look at this. Instead of looking with carbon footprint reduction to all the heavy polluters and just excluding them, what you also can do is just say, hey, I'm not just excluding all these heavy polluters. I maybe want to focus instead of all, on all the companies in the universe and basically look at them in the same way as we looked at ESG scores, namely, we can measure all the carbon footprint of all the companies in the various sectors. And we just focus on those companies in each sector. So not just energy, but also in healthcare and even financials and real estate that have a very low carbon footprint. And if you do so, and again, you also measure next their factor scores, you get this kind of picture. So again, just as with the ESG scores, we look within every sector we can calculate, calculate the uh, carbon score, the carbon footprint of all these companies, but we can also calculate their factor scores. So a company that is very low polluting in the real estate sector and also very high on momentum or value, so really these sources of alpha, which we know that they're gonna drive the returns of portfolios in the long run. Yeah, if we target these type of companies that really have the best of both worlds, low on your carbon footprint, and high on your factor score, yeah, it means that you can create a portfolio that delivers alpha, but also has a low carbon footprint. And you can do this for many different ways, uh, for many different kind of objectives that you have. Not only for low carbon, but you can also do it for waste, for your water footprint, for your energy footprint. It doesn't matter so much, as long as you remember or keep remembering that it really takes two to tango. You need to have low, uh, low footprint scores or high ESG scores, and at the same time, a very high factor score. And if you focus on both, then you're capable of building a portfolio. So to just summarize it, and that also concludes uh, the end of my presentation, how can you get really alpha out of sustainability portfolios? Well, first of all, by making sure you do target a lot of companies that are just not meeting your... Uh, own values. So yes, you still can exclude a lot of sectors that will never be very good to the global sustainable world where we want to live in. But at the same time, you can really force your portfolio to get a 30% higher ESG score or a 20% lower footprint score. And 
where normally with a standard sustainability process that would result in maybe a lower alpha, by combining your ESG integration and your lower footprint with also factor scores, yeah, you can still have a lot of alpha in your portfolio. In fact, it will take a while before you see a big decay in your alpha because you basically look for the best of both worlds. You look for high factor exposure, but also high ESG scores. And that's the way we believe you should integrate sustainability in factor portfolios. And that's the way uh, that we manage also portfolios for our clients. So that was my presentation, Ray. And uh, I look forward to meet you in person again next year in London. Thank you.